YC family and friends, so good to have you with us today. We are in Luke chapter 15. We started last week and we will continue for the next two weeks to talk about uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. Uh, Jesus is making a case for why lost people matter. And today we're going to pick up that conversation and talk about how we can get a better perspective, how we can see things differently. We really last week kind of talked about hearing things differently because it's right there in the text that uh, those who uh, were hearing Jesus well, those who had a good acoustics were the tax collectors and the sinners. The entire chapter's message about lost people mattering stems off of, pivots off of the fact that in Luke 15, 1, the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around Jesus and they were listening. They were hearing the same little Greek word for hear as the last verse in chapter 14. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. The very next thing we look at in 15, 1, the tax collectors and sinners are all there hearing Jesus. And so we talked last week that our hearing has to change. And when our acoustics are good, when our acoustics have changed, we're able to listen to one another. We're able to understand the, the pain and the challenges of those around us. Um, Paul Turnier, a, a French psychologist that I, that I love to read, said, listen to the conversations of our world, those between nations as well as those between couples. They are for the most part dialogues of the deaf. Exceedingly few exchanges of viewpoints manifest a real desire to understand the other person. Misunderstood, we lose our passion for life. We indeed lose ourselves. So we looked at closely last week the story of the lost sheep and how all of us have to be like those tax collectors and sinners that we all have to have good acoustics. And in contrast to the tax collectors and sinners who were listening to Jesus, we had those whose acoustics needed to change and were failing to hear Jesus well. And that was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that we see in verse 2. They were beside themselves in anger and frustration because Jesus was associating with these notorious sinners. So today, I not only want to suggest and encourage you and I to, to adjust our acoustics so we can hear better, I want us also to seek to adjust our sight so we can also see better. I have had lots of issues with my eyes. I've had surgeries. I've had the LASIK surgery, which is really good because um, in my left eye, I can see distance. That's great to see distance, really good. In my right eye, I can see up close. But if I close my left eye, I can't see you very well. You're all of a sudden blurry. A lot of us, we have one eye closed or we have one bad eye and we can't see out of the other. Uh, our vision is distorted. Um, there was a, um, I love the little story I've told you before about the mother that, that uh, was, was sick one day and her husband had to take her kids to school, her daughter to school, sp especially. Um, first grader, she was happy to have daddy take her to school. She's pretty excited about that. The next day, the mother gets in the car. She's taking her daughter to school. And about 90% of the way there, her daughter finally says, mama, where are all the idiots? And uh, her mother's like, uh, where are all the idiots? Uh, what's that, honey? Yeah, uh, where are all the idiots? She's still trying to figure this out. Like, why? What What idiots? She goes, yesterday when daddy took me to, to school, there were idiots all over the place. <laughs> you idiot driver, right? All he could see were the other idiots on the road. <laughs> Part of what you and I have to recognize is that the way we see people affects not only our perception of them, but it can also affect our children's perception of them. It can affect others' perception of them. That was the problem in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. The Pharisees had a sight problem as well as a hearing problem. All they could see in the tax collectors and sinners were what they were doing wrong. All they could see in them is how far they were, they were how far off they were off the mark. All they could see in them is how already they had reasons to write them off. 
as too far gone. God wants you and I to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear that there are people all around us, people who matter to God. And Jesus, in these three stories, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy, is his way of hammering home to our hearts and minds, to our eyes and ears, that lost people matter to him. Lost people matter to him. Chapter 15 of Luke is God's lost and found department. And he wants the church to be his lost and found department. He wants us to, to be those people that, that find individuals and families, uh, people that are estranged and kicked out of one church or kicked out of one situation or another to reach and find them and draw them back into relationship with himself. Over the last um, week or two, I've had the chance to, to connect with a couple people um, who I would say uh, have been lost. They've been lost for multiple reasons. Um, but the neat thing, the beautiful thing is, I've had the chance to sit down with several individuals this week who went from being incredibly lost, incredibly lost, um, unwilling to communicate, disconnected from relationship, um, vitriolic, acidic in their reactions, toxic in their, in their language, um, pulling away from, from believers and the purposes of God. And I've witnessed and experienced them turning around. You see, in the first part of our message today, I want you to, I want you to notice uh, something about each one of the three stories. And then we're going to focus most specifically on the lost coin. But I want to remember the lost, the lost sheep was one in a hundred, the ratio. Um, so the first point in your notes is what was lost. And the first thing that was lost was the lost sheep. It says in verse 15, chapter 15, verse 4, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now, just in case there was some misunderstanding about what Jesus was communicating and those around him was thinking that he was speaking to um, the agricultural environment or he was speaking to the livestock exchange. He wants to make sure that the point isn't about a lost sheep. That was just a picture. That was something they saw in culture. The shepherds were critical and sheep were important. The whole sacrificial system was built off of sheep. Sheep were important, but just in case there was confusion, thinking he was focusing on uh, the livestock exchange. In verse 7, it says, In the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner. Oh, okay, now it's very clear. It's not sheep. It's a person. One sh sinner who repents over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The second story, the lost coin, I want you to see, it says that a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one of them. She has 10, she loses one. First scenario was 100 to 1. Second scenario is 10 to 1. But just in case there's confusion, thinking that Jesus is talking about the treasury department or our bank account or our savings financially, he clarifies in verse 10 and says, in the same way, notice the repetition, from verse 7 into verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Who does what? Who turns. You see, being lost is whenever we've turned away from God, gone our own way, done our own thing, had our own agenda, building our kingdom. And repentance is where we turn around to his way, to his kingdom to his purposes. Every one of us need to recognize that each one of the stories is about people. It's about people. The third story, Jesus clears up any confusion. He tells the story of the lost boy, the lost son. Because why? Because in every single story, the point is people are lost and we can get lost. Today, if you're listening, you may have lost a bit of your way. The good news is, is that lost people matter to God. We can get lost. And the crazy thing about the story of the, of the woman, it's just a couple of verses, right? It's just verse uh, 8, 9, and 10. Three little verses. Let's look at them quickly, and then we'll move forward. It says in verse 8, 
Jesus has already told about the lost sheep. He says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins, 10 silver coins, and loses one of them. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. And there's the, voice we, the verse we looked at earlier. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God's point, Jesus' point in all three stories is lost people matter because people get lost. You and I get lost. The interesting thing about this middle parable, this second story, is where this coin was lost. The sheep was clearly lost uh, in a rugged part of the exterior terrain. We, under we could understand how that could happen. Um, the lost boy, who we'll look at next week, gets, gets lost in a distant country. But in the middle story, the lost coin gets lost in the woman's house, right in her own home, right where things are familiar, right in her own space, in the safest place she could ever have something, she lost something. The crazy thing is, in all three cases of individuals that I spoke with this last two weeks who were lost and have been found, they got lost right in the church. They got lost right in the house, right in the, in the community of believers, where we would think we'd be safe in the fold. Somehow, right in the midst of believers, there was something that caused them to, to lose their way and to go astray. Every one of us is vulnerable to a season of being lost. God wants us his church, to care about the lost. I think in this COVID environment, the disconnect from a place of gathering could easily and most likely has caused others to lose their way. And today, I want to say to you and challenge me and you to reach out, to think, to scratch our heads. Who's been missing? Who have I not spoken to? Who have I not connected with? I sent several messages to individuals this week, individuals that I care about and love, and I've been reaching out to some of them throughout COVID, reaching out and getting a little response, reaching out and getting no response. But what God wants us to do is to keep looking for lost sheep and lost people because we are all vulnerable to being lost. What gets lost? We do. People that we thought were committed gets lost because something else usurps their commitment to Christ and distracts them from his purposes. Number two in your notes is not, do, not only do lost people matter to God and, and we can get lost. How do we get lost? How do we get lost whenever we've got so many great resources more than ever before in history, we've got resources to help us stay connected. And yet we get disconnected. The text gives us three things. Each story gives us its own nuance of how easily we can get lost. Look at them with me. Number one, the first way we get lost in the lost sheep illustration is it says one of the lambs wandered away and was lost. We can wander we can wander. We can wander away. Wandering away, getting lost in that fashion, I say, is usually gradual. It's gradual. One of my, one of my friends who got lost, he, he just started not attending as faithfully. He was in a small group and stopped doing that small group. Stayed engaged a little bit in church services, but all of a sudden COVID comes along and, you know, listened for a couple of weeks, but then stopped listening. It was a very gradual wandering away until he recognized he lost his way. We can get lost gradually. It's like the, it's like the the frog in the kettle. The frog gets dropped in the kettle and the heat comes on and little by little, the frog could jump out of the kettle. He can jump out of a lake. He can jump out of, the, out of water anytime he wants to, but he doesn't realize it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And pretty soon it's in a boil and he can't get out. 
you and I can get lost by simply wandering away from the truth, wandering away from fellowship, wandering away from connection. My friend had a, um, lives up close to me, part of my garage gym. He had his grandchildren over the other day and they were all together and uh, they were excited. They were going to have a, a campfire. And so they, they put a little fire together and, and all of a sudden uh, his wife reached over and she pulled out a coal and she, and she took it off the fire. And she said to the kids, watch that coal. And it was hot, it was red hot. And it just got more and more slowly. It cooled down until finally there was no spark left in it. The fire was still burning, burning fine. But when it went away from the heat, it slowly lost its passion. It lost its flame. Maybe you have lost a bit of your flame. Not because someone's quenched it in a moment, but you've slowly found yourself getting further away from the family of believers, from a connection to others who are passionate about God. Maybe you've wandered, or maybe you know someone who's wandered. That person matters to God. Do they still matter to you? The second reason is in the coin illustration. Um, in verse 8 of chapter 15, it says, Imagine a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one of them. Won't she light the lamp and, and scour the house? The point is, she loses the coin in the house. And it was not gradual, it was sudden. It just fell away. Unaware, the coin falls away. Interesting thing about the early um, first century women. Uh, in Israel, Jewish women would, when married, they would come to marriage with a bit of a dowry. They would come to marriage with some resources. And those resources would have been given to them by their father. And it would have been 10 silver coins. And those coins would be sewn into a headband. And she would, at her wedding, would wear this headband. It would be a way of saying, I'm no longer single I am now married. All the women wore head, head coverings, but a married woman had woven into her head covering 10 silver coins that represented her marriage, much like our wedding ring. There is a high likelihood that the person in this story that Jesus is speaking of would have been a married woman who lost one of her headband coins because it was the number 10 that the women would put in their headband. So to lose one of those, you might say, well, she still has nine left. No, not quite. Because within the culture, if one of those coins were missing, a couple things may be at, at odds. One, she may, have, she may have taken a coin out to spend it, which would mean she wasn't trusting her husband and she was compromising her commitment. Or it could mean that she was unfaithful in her relationship. Not wanting to appear in either light, this lady is going to turn the house upside down, search with a fine-tooth comb to find that missing coin. Why? Because she doesn't want to go back out in the public and misrepresent her morals or her standards, which would heighten her reason for looking for that lost coin. But this coin in this story falls away suddenly and is missing. I think there's a lot of individuals that it looks like they're doing fine. They're, they're connected. They're, they look like they're growing. We call it around here, the poof factor, the poof factor, someone they're engaging. They're coming consistently. Uh, they're, they're meeting multiple people. Staff are getting to know them by name. And all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. All of a sudden it's crickets, not a word, not present won't respond to calls, won't respond to emails. They're just gone. Suddenly, something can happen. Something probably not on the surface, but maybe deep down. Maybe an injury in a relationship. Maybe a moral failure or lapse. And in that moment of failure, they poof, they disappear, and they are lost for a time. We can fall away gradually, we can fall away suddenly, or as with the young man, the son, the third, which we'll look at next week. Look what it says in verses 12 through 14. It says, not long after that, not long after what? 
Verse 12 says, the, 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 the man had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. This kid wants his father's inheritance before his father dies. A little bit arrogant. Not long after that, his father gives him, by the way, his share of the inheritance. Not long after that, that's verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Notice what he did. He went away. Our first thing, our first character, the sheep, wanders away. The second fell away. The third went away willfully. Gradually, suddenly, willfully. Sometimes we get lost because we are in stubborn, resistant rebellion. We are just turning our back on what we believed, turning our back on whatever has been invested in us, turning our back on our morals or our convictions because we want to sow some wild oats, because we want to decide for ourselves if the grass might be really greener on the other side. We can fall away for all kinds of reasons. The people that you and I know that have disconnected from faith, they may indeed have fallen away. They may be growing cold gradually. They may have in a moment suddenly shifted and changed directions. They may willfully have been begun to reject the things they used to say they valued, but now by their behavior, they clearly don't. We fall away for different reasons. Um, there was... Uh, it's interesting to me when, when you think about lost people mattering to God. If you think about uh, over the last two decades, there's been a move to say in education, every child matters. No child left behind in education. We can all get around that and say, absolutely, no child left behind. I mean, no matter what their educational ability and capability is, we should be able to meet whatever child they are, wherever they are, and bring to them the educational opportunity they need so no child will be left behind. Oh, we can all get around that. Say, yes, yes. Oh, and it wasn't that long ago that our military would, would, would remind us that whenever soldiers go into battle, their commitment as, as the U.S. military is no soldier left behind. Oh, and we can clap for that and applaud for that and say, absolutely, no soldier left behind. One for all and all for one. Yes. And in the church, we should also be able to say, no person left behind. No one left behind. That the people around us in our, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in extended families, that those people matter to God. And is there any one of them if Christ returned in a week or a month or a year that you would want left behind? No person left behind. We will only get there if we begin to hear and see differently. If we arrest ourselves and say, you know what? They may be an idiot, but they matter to God. Therefore, I need to change the way I see them, the way I care for them. Until we can begin to recognize that we're carrying with us a misperception, an inaccurate evaluation of others, we will never change that evaluation. I, I'm humored by the fellow that, that um, could not see because of a lack of awareness, which will be our next big point about awareness, getting greater visual awareness, getting better audio awareness. How am I hearing others? The comment the person made that hum was a bit humorous didn't catch themselves. They said, you know, there's people out there in the world who hate their fellow human being. I hate people like that. <laughs> oh, sometimes we can't see for the log in our own eye. God wants us to take the log out of our eye so we can see clearly the value of the person whose speck we're criticizing. God wants us to adjust our acoustics so we can hear people's perspective, even when it's not our own, and still communicate something about their value. Why do lost people matter? Because regardless of where they are or where they're from or what they've done or what they've said or how they've lived, they still matter to him. Do they matter to us? Why should lost people matter? Why should they? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 says it beautifully. In the Message Bible, he wants not only us, but everyone saved. You know, everyone to get to know the truth we've learned. 
that there's one priest mediator between God and us, Jesus, who gave himself as a sacrifice for all men. Why? To set them free. Jesus says, everyone matters. But you and I, if we can't see that they matter, if we can't hear despite their rhetoric, despite their paradigm, despite their opinions, we can't see past the noise or past the fog, we will miss the value of the person we may write off as not worthy. God wants us to recognize that all people matter. Several years ago, must have been probably close to close to eight, maybe 10 years ago, was our first Love Merced opportunity. You maybe you are unfamiliar with the movement. Started in Modesto about a decade ago, uh, moved through the valley to Turlock and to Atwater and to Merced, and cities all across the, the Central Valley were dedicating one day, one day a year, um, and it moved to twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall, where we tried to encourage and motivate every church and every civic organization to come together to rally around the idea of serving our community in a work day. And so on this particular day, it was the first one um, that our city did. And I was working down at the, um, just past um, KAMB, where there was a, a, a group of homeless that had kind of used and, 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 and made a, a lot of trash and collected, and then they abandoned the site. And so there was all kinds of cleanup that was necessary as we went in and kind of repaired what had been kind of dishuffled and mis mistreated. So there are probably about six of us assigned to this site and we're cleaning it up, but it's all going well. It's all going fine. We've got a dumpster there and we're putting all kinds of stuff in the dumpster and, and, and debris, trash, uh, old blankets that had, you know, gotten infested with mice and rats and, and, uh, you know, leftover food cartons from McDonald's and Burger King and, and, uh, Kentucky fried chicken. I mean, you could find anything and everything there. It was just a mess. We worked the whole day. Uh, probably spent six or seven hours cleaning it up and we're all, we're all done. We're getting ready to leave. And I go to get in my car and uh, for some reason I can't find my keys. I'm looking, my, my pockets are empty and, and, uh, and it wasn't, it was too warm for a jacket. And I, I looked on every table, on every shelf, on, on every tree. I, where, where could I put my trees, my keys? I was certain that I had them attached to my belt loop, a little clip, you know, I was sure I had them there, but they're not there now. And I went back and I told the remaining people, there's about three people left. And I said, has anyone seen my keys? No, no, we've not seen your keys. Everybody was tired. Everybody wanted to go home. It had been a long day and we worked hard. But those three individuals said, pastor, We'll help you find your keys. And we started looking and we looked all over the grounds. And then we came to this sobering reality that most likely my keys had fallen off in the midst of picking up debris. And it was connected or combined with the trash that we were throwing in that dumpster. There were food products. There were leaves. There were mice infested blankets, there were trash bags, there were plastic sacks, there was everything imaginable in the dumpster. And we're looking at one another saying, I think the keys are probably in the dumpster. <laughs> None of us wanted to get in the dumpster, but we turned the dumpster on its side and started milling through the trash one handful at a time. It was about an hour of trash digging that the keys were indeed discovered. <laughs> you know, I think there was all kind of, I had every reason in the world to want to abandon that search, but I knew if I didn't find my keys, I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> There's three keys that I want us to look at. That if we want the church to go somewhere in terms of valuing and loving lost people, it has to happen. 
We've got to find these three keys in order to find the resolve to reach lost people for God. To believe that those that may be living a life that's so riddled with trash, we don't even want to be around them. The problem with that trash heap was it smelled, it was dirty, it was rat infested, all kinds of reasons to walk away. But thank God I had three friends that helped me on that day to find my keys. Thank God the three people I've spoken to in the last two weeks had enough redemptive influence that was reaching out to them consistently and faithfully. Relationships that were built and trust that was established that began to move them and turn them from the way they had been going back to the way they needed to go and should go. And now this week, last week, confess to me they're committed to go. Lost people matter. For us to reach them, three things need to happen. Three things that change literally the way we see others. The first one is we have to see something. We have to see their value. We have to see the value. This all comes from the second illustration of the lost coin. There once was a woman who had 10, if you have the ability in your notes to circle or highlight the word valuable silver coins. Each one of these silver coins was called a drachma. And the drachma was worth a day's wage. It was worth, you know, probably only about 20 cents, but that would have been a day's wage. And so a day's wage, that's a significant amount of resources. And then you highlight the resource as a part of a tin linked headband that represents your morals and your commitment. All of a sudden, its value isn't just a day's wage. Its value goes up because any one coin could compromise the statements you make when you go back out in public. This woman was going to turn her house upside down. Why? Because she saw the value in the coin. You and I have to see the value in others. They matter because they have intrinsic worth. They matter because they have intrinsic worth. Each one of those drachma coins would have had the image of Caesar branded on that coin, that they were images that mattered. You and I are marked with the image of God, not because we accept Jesus, but because we've been created in his image. Genesis chapter one, verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Both male and female have been created in God's image. There's no man, there's no woman that does not matter to God because they've been imprinted with his image on them. Why do lost people matter? Because we are aware of their value. We have to be aware that they matter, they have worth, they have value. There was an interesting, cute little ad in the, in the newspaper years ago, back when there was a lost and found department in the newspaper. The ad read like this, lost dog, crippled, only has three legs, blind in one eye, mange on top and side of back, responds to the name, lucky, <laughs> not very lucky. You and I might have that dog dropped off at the pound or released in the back country of, of Merced County because we would consider the dog not worth keeping. But that lost dog mattered to the owner who could see all of its shortcomings, all of its problems, but also its value. The woman in the lost coin could see the value. The shepherd in the lost sheep could see the value. And for you and I to see the neighbor that bothers us and we get past what bothers us, we have to see the value. The coworker who annoys you, who drives you crazy by all their little idiosyncrasies, you'll never reach out to them. You'll never care for them. You'll never invite them to church. You'll never pray for them unless you see their value. The first key for lost people to matter to us like they do to Jesus is to change the way we see, to be aware of their value. The second thing, the second key to 
unlocking ability to, to value lost people is to see the vacuum, is to not just see the value, but to see the vacuum. What do you mean by that vacuum? What do you mean, pastor? What I mean is when they're missing, it matters. When they're missing, it matters. This woman with this lost coin was not only, I mean, she still had nine more coins, but it didn't make any difference. The, her, what was missing was this coin completed a headband that, that said and personified her marital commitment, her moral commitment, her righteousness in her relationship with her husband in society was represented every time she walked out the door, she had the headband on with 10 coins intact. That one coin announced to her something that matters is missing. You know, one of the individuals that I met with this week has been missing for several months. And I have fired off a half a dozen messages. And I know others within our community have fired off multiple messages. As I met with that individual, I asked them, what have you experienced re-engaging with our church family? And the person kind of choked up a little bit and said that I matter. Uh, I felt loved. Why did he feel loved? Does he re entered community because he knew from those around him that had reached out to him that with him gone, there was something, there was someone missing. If you have strayed and no one's reached out to you, it's because we can unfortunately get lost in a crowd. My friend that has come back who was lost and is found had made the step from public service to small group experience, from the crowd to the core. That experience brought him into community, and that community missed him because we enjoyed him so much. We relentlessly continued to reach out to him. Maybe my words to you today is the reach necessary for you to go from crowd to community, from peripheral to center, from observational to participational. God wants you and I to be involved in our faith in such a way that when we are absent, someone says, they're missing. They're missing. Notice, see the vacuum. There are people that have not yet been brought into the kingdom of God that are our next worship leaders. There are individuals who've not yet been brought into the kingdom of God that are our next Sunday school leaders. There are people who've not been yet brought into the kingdom of God that are our next small group champions. There are people who have not yet been brought into the family of God that are next evangelists. One day, Billy Graham was sitting in a room and he listened to someone preach a message, a, a person that if I told you their name, you would never have, you wouldn't know them, you'd never heard of them in your life. But that person's message touched Billy Graham because he was missing from God's purposes and kingdom. I don't know what place you fill in the kingdom of God, where you go on the headband, but I know if you're not in the kingdom and you're not participating in kingdom business, there's something missing because you're not there. Who's missing from the kingdom of God that may be your neighbor or coworker, cousin, aunt, uncle, brother or sister or friend? Lost people matter. The third key and final key is not just to, 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 to care. To care is the second message, uh, to be aware that they're missing, to care, to care that they're missing, to be aware of their value. The third one is not just to see the value, see the vacuum, but to see the validation. To see the validation. Two things validate this coin's um, worth and its value. Two things validate it. Validation is an important word. One of the individuals that I spoke with that uh, was struggling uh, and lost his way 
lost his way because he didn't feel like his concerns were validated. No one heard him. The little quote that I gave by um, uh, Paul Tournier, that listen to the conversations of our world, those between nations as well as couples. They are for the most part dialogues of the deaf. When we don't feel understood, we don't feel validated. Our hearing and our sight, to hear people, to see people, to listen to people, to care, to have them feel understood, makes them recognize and realize they matter. I guarantee you, in relationships and in conflict, as soon as someone connects with you in such a way that they feel heard, they feel like they matter. Because being heard and being loved are so closely related, the average person can't tell them apart. Being heard and being loved are so closely connected that the average person cannot tell them apart. When you validate someone, you say by your listening and concern, you matter. And when they know they matter, they look for their place so they're no longer missing. When they know that they matter, they begin to recognize their value and they become more aware of it themselves. If the first point here in, in someone seeing the value is I'm aware of their value. The second point is I care that they're missing. The third one is I need to share in the search. Two things expressed the validation of this missing coin. One was the search. It says that when she lost one of them, she swept the entire house diligently searching every corner of the house until she found the one lost coin. The search validated the worth. The search validated the worth. When you reach out to someone, that reaching, that searching, that looking for them validates their worth. The second thing was the celebration, not just the search, but also the celebration. In verse 9, it says, come and celebrate with me. I had lost my precious silver coin, but now I found it. The search and the celebration, both are the validation that they matter. You and I, are called to recognize people's value, to be aware of it. You and I are called to care that someone might be missing. You and I are called to share in the search. I love Romans chapter 10, verse 14, which says, how can people, how can people know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how are they going to, and how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? You and I are the ones that are sent to share the message that they matter and there's someone they can trust. The body of Christ grows stronger day by day and week by week and month by month when we build trusting relationships with one another. And unfortunately, sometimes even within the house of God, someone gets lost. Maybe because there's been a breach in trust. Maybe because they've been wounded in a relationship. God wants you and I to be the people that recognize we are doing our best and we will still fail. We are searching with all diligence and we will still get tired and lose our way. We are seeking to reach out, but in many cases, our reach will fall short. The part that is critical to understand is that this body that we are a part of, and it doesn't matter if it's the body at Yosemite Church or the church down the street or across town or in another town or another state or across the world, is filled with imperfect people. Imperfect people that get lost because we wander, because we fall away, because we sometimes just go away. Sometimes it's gradual. Other times it's sudden. Other times it's willful. We are a part of a body that God says expresses the beauty of beauty and the image of God, but also the fragility and brokenness of man. The sooner I recognize that I am lost, I am last, I am least, the more I'm going to be patient whenever you're lo lost or you're last or you're feeling least. And when we hold on to that 
ability for humility, all of a sudden I give you grace to not have it all together. Grace to make a mistake. Grace to fall short. One of my friends in the conversation about his return, I asked, what's one of the things that's most precious in coming back? He said, the grace of God. The grace of God. Today, I want to encourage you to embrace his grace. The more filled we are with the grace of God, the more that grace will be extended to others who've lost their way. What Jesus wants us to know from Luke 15, God's lost and found department, is that lost people matter. But whenever you and I find the keys of valuing, of validating, of sharing their, uh, recognizing the vacuum of them not there, when we can take those keys, uh, we can be on the move to reach the next person that's forgotten that they matter and doesn't know they're missed, but is desperate for validation. Heavenly Father, we want to ask that you would empower us, Lord, as the, as the body of Christ at Yosemite Church to be a place where people can always return for, when, for no matter what reason they've turned away, they can always return. And so, Lord, today we ask that you would empower us to be a people that go after the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. That you would help us, Lord, to have ears to hear and eyes to see that lost people matter. If you need to come home today, whisper this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I, 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 I want to embrace your forgiveness as much as I know how. Accept me, Lord, and empower me to return to my first love, the, the love I have for you and the love you have for me. God, forgive me for wandering. Forgive me, Lord, for falling. Forgive me, Lord, for being willfully disobedient. Today we come back to you, Lord, and embrace your grace and your mercy. Fill us so full today with who you are, it spills out on those that are so far away. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Uh, it was chilly outside this week. Next week is going to be beautiful. Join us for outdoor services. God bless you. I'll see you soon. I want to thank you for all of the faithful giving and your support over the years. You know, it's because of you and your giving that we've been able to meet you right where you are and to love you to where Christ wants you to be. And during these kind of crazy times, we want to just continue to be faithful. So I just want to take a moment and remind you the ways that you can give. First, you can go to yc.church and just click the Give tab. It's super easy. Second, you can text YC Give, the literal words YC and Give, to 77977. And then lastly, go to the YC app. And remember that even though the office is closed to the public right now, you can still call us at 383-5038 to speak to someone because we've got people answering the phones all the time. Have a blessed, wonderful, awesome, stupendous, incredible day.